Hi, in this video, we are going to look at something called the trihedral and three planes that are associated with this. Now, what's our motivation? Well, when we study curves, particularly space curves, they can be quite complicated and the computations can be quite complex. So, just like what we do in other situations, we try to simplify the problem using approximations. So we might want to find a simpler curve, which is a good approximation of the original curve near a particular point. Uh, for example, instead of using a space curve, maybe we can find a plane curve uh, which is a good approximation, so we only have to deal with really two dimensions. Or we may want to have a simpler curve, uh, like a line. That's what we do in Calc 1. We look at a function and say we can use the tangent line as a good approximation. Or in ca Calculus 2, we learn that we can use a Taylor polynomial as an even better approximation. And here we're going to see that uh, we can actually use a circle in some cases. So what is this thing called the trihedral or the triad? Well, recall our unit tangent vector and its derivative. The derivative t prime is orthogonal to the unit tangent vector. And so we're going to define the principal unit normal vector. We'll use uppercase n for the principal unit normal vector to be the unit vector in the direction of the derivative of the unit tangent vector. So the derivative of t or t prime. So we just take t prime and divide it by its length, and that will be our normal vector. Instead of saying principal unit normal vector, we can just say normal vector. Now, the normal vector is going to point in the direction of the change of t. Remember, t has a constant length 1. The only thing that can change about the unit tangent vector is its direction. So think of it this way. Uh, the unit tangent vector tells you where the direction that you're, you're going now. And then the unit normal vector points in the direction where you're going to turn in the future. So let's look at, at our little racetrack example that we've seen before. And I've selected three points and drawn the unit tangent vector. So uh, implicit in this graph is the assumption that we are going around the course in a counterclockwise direction. So pointing in the direction of change of t, the way to remember that is that it's always going to be pointing towards the inside of the curve. So for example, at point P, we're going in this counterclockwise direction. And going around that bend, I'll be curving. Uh, if I'm facing the, the unit tangent vector, I'll be curving to the right. So my normal vector is going to point in that right direction. And so the normal direction, normal vector points to the inside of the curve. Same idea at point Q, and I'm going around this curve in this direction. And so I am, again, if I'm, if you think of yourself as being in a car going around the track in that direction, then you are uh, making a left hand turn. And that is the direction that the normal vector is pointing. Now, what about at R? R is on a straight line or straight line segment. 
And there, the unit normal vector is going to be the zero vector, because along a straight line, the length of the unit tangent vector does not change, and its direction does not change. So there is no change. So we'll have the unit normal vector being the zero vector if the curve is a straight line. And finally, to complete our triad or trihedral, we need a third vector, and it's called the unit binormal vector. We use uppercase B for that vector, and we define it as the cross product of the unit tangent by the unit normal. So the order matters, and the way I remember it is that we first have to calculate the unit tangent before we can calculate the unit normal. And so the unit tangent comes first, and then that gets crossed with our normal vector. So let's go ahead and show that uh, we've got a unit vector. Let me go through this step by step. Um, so our binormal vector is the cross product of t with n, so the unit normal by the unit tangent vector by the unit normal. So we'll just take the length of each side. Now we have a formula for the length of the cross product. It's just the length of the first vector times the length of the second vector times the sine of the angle between them. But we said that the unit normal and the unit tangent are orthogonal to each other. So that would mean that the angle between them must be pi over 2 radians. And so sine of uh, pi over 2 is 1. The length of each of those vectors is 1 because they're unit vectors. And so our uh, the length of the binormal vector is also 1. So it's also a unit vector. All right, let's uh, take a look at this. So the idea is that now the uh, three vectors are going to form this orthogonal uh, triple at each point along the curve. So here's an example where we're shown a uh, rather crazy curve and uh, the unit tangent vector at a specific point on the curve. So it's a little bit hard with these three degree gaps, but certainly we can see uh, the direction that the say particle is moving or that the curve is being traversed. And we can see the way it's curving. So we would expect that the normal vector is going to point inside that curve. Now, to figure the binormal vector, we have to remember the right-hand rule. So I couldn't quite get this picture of the hand to perfectly line up, but you can see that if I have the my finger in the direction of the tangent vector, the rest of my hands, uh, or you know, uh, the rest of my fingers, uh, pointing in the direction of the normal vector. Uh, then uh, the binormal should be pointing um, upward. And so it would look something like that. All right, so these three vectors, in a way, they form a local coordinate system. So when we're close to that point or uh, at that point, it may be instead of using our i, j, and k, it may be more useful to use t, n, and b. Um, so to kind of see how this uh, triad, the, these three vectors are uh, changing, around the curve, I'm going to take you to this website uh, called Calcplot3D. It's really, really useful 
Uh, it's really made for teaching Calculus 3. And uh, I'd just like to show you this example. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing uh, my slides, and then we'll start sharing the uh, browser. So let me share that. All right, and moving it over to the right side. There it is. So here I have the same curve, and here is the uh, unit normal, I mean, the unit tangent, the unit, so the unit tangent, the unit normal is the blue vector, and the binormal is the red vector. And let's just watch as we traverse the curve how these vectors change. So you can see it's like a roller coaster or uh, maybe a plane doing some aerobatic maneuvers. Let me go back to the slides now. All right. So if I look at these three vectors pairwise, first, if I look at T and N, they determine a plane. And that plane is called the osculating plane. It's important because it's the best plane to approximate the path of the curve near the given point. So we were saying that maybe if we could uh, consider it as being a plane curve, well, if we wanted to approximate it with a plane curve, we'd want to approximate it with a curve that lies in this osculating plane. By the way, the word osculating comes from the Latin word for to kiss. So we call this the kissing plane because it just near that point, it just touches the curve. Our second plane is the plane determined by the normal and binormal vectors. And that's the called the normal plane because it is orthogonal to the curve at the given point. And finally, the plane determined by T and B, so the tangent and the binormal vector, is called the rectifying plane. Uh, it's the best plane to use to flatten the curve. So if, uh, you know, for example, if I were to imagine that this curve actually were uh, some kind of wire or something like that, and I wanted to flatten it out, well, if uh, I'd want to place it on a hard surface, which is parallel to the rectifying plane, and then I could pound it out flat. So let's do an example where we're going to find these uh, triad vectors as a function of t. Now, normally, finding these as a function of t can be quite complicated um, because of the derivatives. Uh, this example is not going to be too bad. Uh, usually, though, we don't want to find them as functions of t. We just want to find t, n, and b for a specific value of t. So our curve has the following component functions, 4 thirds t to the 3 halves power. So implicit in this first component is a uh, square root. And that's why we have to say t has to be greater than or equal to 0. Second component is negative 1 half t squared. And the third component is 2t. So Let's start by finding the tangent vector. So first derivative. And then let's look at its length. So it's actually kind of interesting here that 
uh, when I square all of these components and I look at what I have, I have t squared plus 4t plus 4. That is actually the square of a binomial. Now, normally when you take the square root of the square of a number, you get the absolute value. But in our case, since we know that t has to be greater than or equal to 0, then we know that t plus 2 is always a positive number. So I can leave off the absolute value signs. So then, uh, and that's again because t is greater than or equal to 0. All right, so I am going to then uh, write this in the following form and for a reason. Uh, so I'm going to keep this. This is the 1 over the length of r prime. I'll write that using an exponent because I'll want to use the power rule. Uh, and I'll keep it factored out so that when I take the derivative, I'm going to use the product rule. Now I have a scalar function out in front and then a vector function. But remember, we, we can use the product rule in that case. So I'll take the derivative of the first, and that's just going to give me negative parentheses 2t plus 2 raised to the power of negative 2 times the second with no derivative. And then I'll keep the first unchanged and then take the derivative of the vector function. So now I want to write that as a single vector. And each component then, I'm going to bring them under a common uh, denominator. So I'll do a little algebra. And then I can collect some like terms and get some simplifications from that too. So moving on to the next page here, uh, I've just summarized what we've learned from the first set of computations. We've got r prime, the length of r prime, uh, we found what the unit tangent vector is, and we've got an expression for the uh, derivative of the unit tangent vector. So I need to find its length. So instead of just taking the square root of the sum of the squares, I'm going to go back and use a formula that we studied when we were learning about curvature. We said that uh, we learned there that we could calculate the length of the derivative of t using this formula. It's a fraction where on top we have the length of r prime crossed with r double prime, and on the bottom I have the length of r prime squared. So it's not hard to find the, the second derivative with our simple uh, component functions. And then it's not hard to find the cross product. So now I've got my, uh, and in fact, in my cross product, I mean, let me just make sure I did this right. So I would have negative t times 0, subtract a negative 2, which will make a positive 2. Then for the jth component, I'd have 2t to the 1 half power times 0 subtract 2 times t to the negative 1 half. So OK, so I do have a, a mistake here because I can't forget that j. It doesn't uh, affect the final result because um, in the end, I'm going to take the magnitude of this. But I should have been more careful here because I'm subtracting off 2 times t to the negative 1 half. But for the jth component, I have to change the sign. So let me just take out my eraser and make that. Oh, no, I had it right. <laughs> Not a problem. I was looking at the wrong term. This is positive. OK, good. And then final. For the kth component, 
I will have a negative 2t to the 1 half minus a negative, if I take that product, I'll get a t to the 1 half. So I can combine those like terms. And that is um, r prime crossed with r double prime. I need its length. So let me just square each one. So the first one squared is going to give me just 4. This is 2 over radical t. So when I square it, I get 4 over t. And then this is negative radical t. When I square it, I just get t. Now I can do some algebra with this, write it with a, a single denominator, and I'll get, from this term I get t squared, from the 4 I'll now have 4t, and then from the original 4 over t I just have plus 4. So I can factor the top of that fraction and take the square root and I'll get that t plus 2. The bottom I still have to keep as radical t. Well, I'd already calculated before that uh, the magnitude of r prime of t is t plus 2. So I'll just need to take this expression from the length of the cross product and divide it by t plus 2 squared. Well, that's the same as multiplying by 1 over t plus 2 squared. And I'll be able to divide out one of the t plus 2 factors. And so then the length of t prime is 1 over radical t times the quantity t plus 2. All right, so I've got t prime. I've got its length in a very nice uh, compact expression. And uh, if I divide by um, the length of t prime, that's the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So the reciprocal of that would just be radical t parentheses t plus 2. And that's nice because inside each component in the denominator, I have a factor of t plus 2 squared. So I can clean that expression up a little bit. And in fact, I will factor out that 1 over t plus 2 and write it as t plus 2 raised to the power of negative 1. So I've got my unit tangent vector and my unit normal vector. And we can do a quick check to make sure that these two are orthogonal. Um, we don't need to worry about the uh, scalars in front. They don't affect the direction of the vector. So uh, if I take the dot product here, here I'll have 4t to the 1 half coming from the first component. And then in the third component, I'll have a negative 4 to the t1 half. And so that is going to give me 0. Still back to the first component, I'm going to multiply 2t to the 1 half times negative t. So that's going to give me negative 2t raised to the um, 3 halves power. And then the second component's their product gives me a positive 2t raised to the 3 halves product. So when I take the dot product, I will indeed get 0. So the only thing that's left to calculate is our binormal vector. And that I can do using the cross product. I am going to use some properties of the uh, cross product. Again, these functions that I've factored out in front, they're scalar functions. And so I can factor one of the t plus 2 raised to the power of negative 1 out in front, and then the other one as well. And they'll multiply together to give me, in front of the cross product operation, a multiplying factor of t plus 2 raised to the power of negative 2. So now let's just evaluate the cross product. 
I can't forget this factor. So uh, ith component, I'm going to get, uh, well, negative t times negative 2t to the 1 half. That gives me positive 2t to the 3 halves. Now subtract off a negative 4t to the 1 half, but subtracting a negative means adding. And then same thing, let's make sure I remember the j to sw swap the sign. So this would be a, uh, this would be f negative 4t, but swapping the sign gives me Oh, okay, yeah, this is going to be a negative 4t. But then I have, okay, I already collected like terms, and that's correct. And then the kth term is correct as well. And what's interesting about these three uh, component functions from the cross product is that I can factor out a common factor in each one. The common factor, greatest common factor is 2t to the 1 half in the first component. In the second component, the greatest common factor is 2. And, and then in the third component, I'm factoring out a negative t, which means that every component has a factor of t plus 2, which will divide out with one of the factors that I have multiplied out in front. So for the binormal vector, then, I still have the same factor out in front, t plus 2 to the negative 1 power, and the component functions shown here. So those are our three uh, vectors that make our triad. As you can see, they're going to change for every value of t. So I've got one more example to do, but I don't want this video to go on uh, too long. So I'm going to make a separate video for the last example where we actually calculate a circle which is a good approximation for the curve near a given point.